Chapter 171, Distress and Lunary and Tribe. Underscore 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 POV narration underscore underscore underscore. The crew saw it clearly, what appeared to be nothing more than a village in the distance, all built around what looked to be the root of a large tree. I've never heard of something like this before. Shiki sounded profoundly confused as he took out a map and started looking through it. Don't bother. If this place was recorded on any maps, then it wouldn't exist anymore. Zebek's voice was rough, emotionless almost, as he continued walking closer and closer to the village. Newgate and the others looked at each other with quite a bit of confusion, before continuing and following their captain. Do you know this place, Francisco? Correa asked as she looked at their first mate, who was walking in line with them, tracing the captain's steps. Not personally. No. But I think I've heard of it. Francisco's eyes narrowed as he looked at the giant root slash branch sprouting out of the ground in the middle of that village. Well tell us. Don't go all cryptic on us. Whitebeard scowled a bit as his blonde hair danced in the wind. Correja also nodded, expecting some kind of explanation from their one agreeable superior. I can't say for sure, as I've only briefly heard about this place. Francisco then started speaking, looking ahead to his captain, as if asking for permission to speak. Upon seeing the lack of reaction, as Zebek continued to walk forward, he simply decided to go on. This place might be captain's hometown. The place where he was born. Francisco rubbed his chin as he remembered the few stories he had heard from Zebek regarding said hometown. Hmm. So that's what we're doing? Visiting his fucking childhood home? Shiki's scowl deepened as he looked at his captain's back with a bit of hatred in his gaze. What a waste of time. Whitebeard also shook his head, he had joined the Rocks Pirates in a somewhat forced manner, but he still wanted to spend his time on more useful endeavors. Like making money. His home was quite poor, so the more he made the more he could send back at the very least. Correa didn't really seem to care as much, she simply narrowed her eyes while looking at the back of her captain, likely plotting some other way of assassinating him using her medicine. Alas, Zebek was completely immune to poison, and even regular medicine, so she was shit out of luck. I doubt this will be a simple home visit if what I've heard from Zebek is real. Francisco gulped a bit as he turned and looked at the rest of the crew. Underscore underscore underscore. Wait wait. So Zebek was a Lunarian? Enel asked as one of his earlobes grasped at a sake bottle and brought it closer to him. Yes. He was a Lunarian, born in the tribe we were visiting. Francisco said as he stopped relieving the events of that day for a moment. Enel nodded when hearing that. Countless theories bubbling up in his mind, as he realized that the origins of Rock's D. Zebek were far from ordinary. I guess him being a Lunarian shouldn't be shocking. But where were his wings? Shiki at the other side of the small table also sighed. The next events are quite fucked up when you put it like that. I did hear some of what happened next. At least the results. Enel frowned a bit as he remembered Sengoku's story regarding that same settlement. Well, the way we got to those results is even worse than you'd think. A forced smile rose to Franksico's lips, as he then continued his tale. Underscore underscore underscore. We're here. Zebek muttered as he stood a bit closer to the village, it was so close that he could smell it at that point, the smell of civilization in a barren wasteland. What's the plan, Captain? Francisco walked closer to his captain, standing by his side. The swordman's shape gaze studied the houses in the distance, all of them seemed to be lively, children were playing on the streets, and adults were working on different crafts. It was a calming scene, a tribal society living secluded from the world, self-sufficient and happy. This is disgusting, Zebek said as he scowled deeply. Boy, mustache. The captain turned his head to look at Whitebeard, who just raised an eyebrow in response. Hit that village with everything you've got. I want to see it turn to dust, right now. Zebek showed Newgate a sadistic smile, his words shocking the rest of the crew into silence. W what? I I sent this a bit much? Asked Whitebeard as his eyes looked at the families living in that village. 
Did I ask for an opinion, dipshit? If you don't do it here, then we can go back to your hometown. Zebek smiled as he showed his fangs to his tall subordinate. Whitebird's eyebrows scrunched up as he frowned and looked at the village in front of him with a conflicted gaze. Francisco also scowled a bit as he looked at his captain. What's on your mind? Newgate really had no choice at that point, Zebek never threw around empty threats, that much he had learned already. Walking forward, he looked at the children playing in the distance with pity in his eyes. Koreha behind them simply looked away, not wanting to bear witness to such a thing, while Shiki had his gaze just fixated on his captain's back. A white halo surrounded Newgate's fist, veins popped out all around his arm as he flexed it. I'm sorry. Only Francisco heard Newgate's words at that moment, nothing more than a whimper really. With a roar, Newgate's fist broke the air in front of him, space itself cracked and the world trembled under the power of his devil fruit. And just like that. Everything collapsed. The solid dirt of the red line cracked heavily, their houses turning to dust and being blown away by the sheer shockwave from the fruit with the capability to destroy the world. Screams rang out as flames quickly started appearing all around the village, shocking the crew members once more. Whitebird's eyes widened as well when he noticed it, unsure how such a thing would have happened. D did they have anything capable of starting such a fire in this village? So those old phobies are still alive, huh? Where is he though? Zebek's smile turned more and more demented by the second, as the rocks pirates looked at three figures rising from the rubble, with flames dancing around them. Three old men, all with white hair and long beards, all wearing tribal robes and wielding bone spears. Each had a set of large black wings on their back. It wasn't long before said figures noticed the rocks pirates, all of them quickly started flying to intercept them. Francisco's hand immediately appeared on the hilt of his blade, prepared to take it out at a moment's notice. These three. They feel dangerous. They certainly felt like a much greater challenge than anything they could have found in the first half of the Grand Line. Newgate and Shiki seemed to agree, as they had both already taken out their weapons. The fledgling Golden Lion pulled out his two blades from his waist, and Newgate took Morakumajiri from his back. Zebek just continued smiling, his eyes shining with energy as he started cracking his knuckles. What is the meaning of this? A booming voice was heard, and a fourth figure rose out of the wreckage, an inferno of white flames melting the debris around him. The man was a bit younger than the other three, having a sharp jawline and rather handsome features, as well as a head of long black hair, coupled with a short beard. His wings were even larger than those of the elders. And he was dressed as a tribal warrior, with a loincloth covering his lower body, and a bare upper body revealing a multitude of tribal tattoos. He was wielding a strange sword, which seemed to be segmented, capable of turning into a whip at a moment's notice. The middle-aged man turned and looked at the rock's pirates, the hate burning in his eyes was noticeable even from a distance. You. Z Beck. The man's wings flapped immediately, and he had already traveled half of the distance between them in a single leap. White flames engulfed his blade as he rushed forward, but he wasn't the only one acting. Zebek's previous crazed smile turned serious, as he rushed and met the middle-aged man in the middle. Zebek clenched his fist and a blue flame engulfed it, the flames formed a claw, as he clashed with the middle-aged man in that instant. The shockwave from their blast pushed the old Lunarian that had been rushing the rock's pirates back. Chieftain. You can't fight that demon alone, let us assist you. One of the elders shouted as he twirled his spear around his wrist, his orange flames dancing in the wind as they completely engulfed his body forming a strange fiery cloak. Don't get involved you three. Handle his associates. I'll take him on. The chieftain shouted as he continued clashing with Zebek, flames, as well as dark blue and white lighting, bounced off all around them as they clashed with both wills and fire. Francisco immediately pulled out his blade and rushed the elder that had cloaked himself in flames, his blade clashing with the elder's spear causing even more shockwaves around them, and sending the elder flying backwards. The swordsman patted his shoulder, as his clothes burned a little, while the elder simply wiped some blood from his lips. Z Beck! You little rat! You even brought outside demons with you! The elder shouted as his flames seemed to rage even more. 
Zebek, however, ignored him completely, as he was having a conversation with the chieftain directly. What, did you think you wouldn't get to see me again? Zebek's serious expression morphed a bit, as his lips turned upward. You thought you could just sell me off to the world government and get away with it? Zebek's enraged voice could be heard throughout the makeshift battlefield. TSK. Why couldn't you just die quietly? The chieftain said as his blade unfolded and slashed at Zebek's torso. Even though the captain had used armament, the blade still cut into his muscles, with blood spraying everywhere. But he ignored it, as his flaming fist barreled forward and into the chieftain's chest, sending him flying backwards as a ball of blue and white flame. Ha! You wish you little shit. You thought living under them would be better for us? You were scared of my ideals, weren't you? Well, my time as a slave only strengthened them. Zebek's eyes shined as his blue flames melted the ground all around him, the cut on his chest cauterizing in an instant as well. Francisco scowled a bit when seeing how his captain had gotten injured. The other crewmates behind them were also rather shocked to see that Zebek was indeed capable of bleeding. But they didn't get a lot of time to relax. Francisco's expression turned grim as the elder he had pushed back was quick to bounce back to him. He was clearly the strongest out of the three, his flames burning the brightest and hottest, though they felt almost like nothing when compared to those of the chieftain and Zebek. Francisco smiled as his blade whizzed as turned completely black. The treasure he wielded was a longer-than-average saber with a green hilt and a wide and thin guard around the hilt. It was named Griffin, one of the twelve supreme great swords. Francisco's griffin clashed with the elder's bone spear, sending sparks and blowing flames all around them. But the other elders weren't staying quiet. Instead, they rushed over to help their fellow old man. Seeing that Shiki scowled and jumped into the fray, his flying slashes intercepting one of the elders as he quickly started flying around and touching as much rubble as possible. The other elder pressed forward through, with Shiki being unable to stop him. At that point, Whitebeard clenched his teeth and also joined in, taking on the third elder with a flying shockwave sent from his Murakumajiri. The fight raged on, as Korea pulled out her mace and went to assist Shiki, who was the weakest of the three at the time. She kicked up pieces and rocks, batting them towards the elder fighting the fledgling golden lion with deadly accuracy. At that point, it was an all-out brawl. Zebek's fight still raged on, as he chased after the chieftain without even sparing a glance to his crew. Underscore underscore underscore. So you all just ruined the village at your captain's command? And they were even able to retaliate? Enel asked as he tried to wrap his head around the information he was receiving. Newgate had no way of refusing the captain's orders. Also, they did not just retaliate. This was the first time in my life I've seen Zebek struggle. Just to give you some perspective. The second time I've seen him struggle like that was at God Valley. Francisco broke out of his trance as he answered his current captain directly. Enel's confusion wasn't exactly satiated though. So Zebek was sold off to the world government as a slave. By the chieftain and maybe the elders? Were the Lunarians trying to work together with the world government? There were far too many questions, and it seemed that Francisco could easily see the confusion in his eyes. Alas, he couldn't answer unasked questions, so he just continued giving Enel some information regarding the Lunarians of old. The Lunarians were a strong race, it's no wonder the world government wanted them gone. They felt threatened by it. Even the weakest adult was stronger than regular pirates on the Grand Line. Francisco had a grim smile on his face as he explained more to his current captain. W8. So where are the rest of the adults in this story then? Enel asked as he raised an eyebrow. Oh, they'll be arriving soon. Shiki scowled as he decided to respond on his friend's behalf. Francisco just sighed and continued his story. Underscore underscore underscore. Just as Shiki had said, the adults weren't all asleep or sleeping underneath the rubble of their former homes. At the time when Whitebird's quake rippled through the village, only the weakest were there, children and some of the women to care for them. The elders and chieftains were also present. 
but the rest were on a hunting trip. One that was cut short by the tremor they all felt. Zebek wasn't worried about them in any way though, instead, he focused on the man in front of him. Their fight was happening much closer to the village, much closer to the corpses of the children inside of it, all crushed by the shockwave or swallowed up by cracks in the ground. Look around you. This is all your fault. Zebek told the chieftain as his fists bled and clashed with the man's flexible blade. Don't go throwing around blame you demon. You are the one that refused to bend. Do you think the world is a joke? No one can stand up against the world government. You would have gotten all of us killed. The chieftain shouted as he kicked Zebek's torso, flinging him backwards, only for the chieftain's blade to turn into a razor-bladed whip and drag him back by wrapping around one of his ankles. The chieftain then smashed him into the ground and tried to rip off his leg. Zebek scowled a bit in pain, as his hand grasped at the whip slash blade. With immense strength, the captain pulled the chieftain closer, the tribal warrior's feet dragging on the ground as he tried to resist. You coward! Zebek's fist lashed out, hitting the man's face, only to be blocked with a forearm. Zebek held the tribal warrior in place with one hand, while the other lashed out and punched him again and again, with blood and fire billowing out of them with every strike. The chieftain's muscles trembled as his bones cracked, each punch dealing irreparable damage to his arm, still, he held on, his blade cutting more and more into Zebek's legs, while their flames wrestled for control. They plucked my wings out and branded me like a pig. Just because you were too afraid I'd replace you in a few years. Zebek's voice sounded out with rage and distress, as he continued lashing out and turning the chieftain's arm into a paste. The chieftain at that point was forced to let go of his blade and jump backwards, his arm hanging limply by his side and his body filled with slight burns. Meanwhile, Zebek's legs were filled with cuts, one of his palms was completely cut open all the way to the bone, while the other was slightly burnt as well. You fool! The chieftain still scowled, despite his state. He looked around, hoping to see his elders winning and joining him in repelling Zebek. But the sight he was greeted with was something else entirely. Francisco had already cut the elder he had been fighting in two, the elder's flames already long extinguished. Whitebird's fight was also over, the elder he had been fighting was already underneath his leg, as the ground around them was completely cracked. Shiki had also somehow managed to finish off his opponent, encasing him in a ball of rocks and crushing him alive before burying him in the ground. It was at that point that the chieftain had lost all hope. At least until they appeared. Chieftain! A spear was thrown, forcing Zebek to dodge to the side. Dozens upon dozens of adults appeared in the distance. The hunters were back to the village. And they weren't pleased. Underscore underscore underscore. Hope you liked the chapter. Pretty long, but it was actually enjoyable to write about the rocks pirates, smiley face. Feels noise. If you wanna support me look up Vegan Master, Vegan Cult, on patter underscore on, you'd also get 10 chapters in advance, or 5 depending on tier. Chapter 172, Lunary and Warriors, Ending in Visit. Underscore 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 POV narration underscore underscore underscore. The Lunarian hunters hadn't known what to expect after feeling that earthquake rattle the earth, they only knew that they needed to rush back to their tribe to help. Many were concerned for their families and their children. Both men and women looked at the ruins of their village in a petrified state. The first one to act was one of the men. A father that could only see the unmoving arm of his daughter sticking out from underneath the rubble of his house. With anger in his gaze and fire radiating off of him, he threw the first spear, which sped past the village like a bullet, threatening to impale Zebek in an instant, only barely dodged by the pirate captain. The hunters then saw their dead or dying elders on the field, rage had well and truly set in. Dozens of warriors, winged men and women descended upon the rocks pirates with unextinguishable fury. Zebek was powerful, so only the strongest hunters tried to encircle him, only to be burned by his blue flames, as they gained a black hue. You fucking mindless ants. You all should wait for your turn to die. Zebek's angry voice shocked them, as some finally recognized him. Whitebeard, Franksico and Shiki had to deal with a few dozen warriors each, 
with Koreha assisting Shiki as much as possible. Zebek's fight with the chieftain continued, and some of the hunters that had been encircling Zebek decided to try and use some ranged attacks. Rox did his best to fight off both the injured chieftain and the stronger hunters, but he still ended up receiving three spears in his back, which prompted him to shout. Francisco! You better stop fucking around and get to work! Zebek's angry voice cut through the battlefield, angering some of the hunters further. Francisco just sighed as his blade cut through a few more hunters before he finally took a deep breath and dashed towards the stronger hunters that had been circling around Zebek. He ignored the spears and arrows headed for him, he ignored the raging flames that burnt his skin as he danced around the hunters, spilling their blood and guts everywhere with each move that he made. Zebek heaved a tired sigh as he finally got some time to recover his energy thanks to Francisco's rampage. The chieftain still looked at Zebek with pure anger, before his gaze also landed on Francisco and the rest. Shit. They're all too strong. In the background, Whitebeard was also accumulating injuries, but his shockwaves were crushing the hunters around him and rattling the battlefield constantly. It also seemed to help Shiki with his powers, as he was able to float up and control more and more of the battlefield thanks to Newgate. The hunters were quickly losing, and the chieftain knew that he had to kill Zebek quickly. Taking a deep breath, a powerful white flame covered him like a cloak, he seemed to melt the ground around him wherever he stepped, his blade extending and flinging some magma towards Zebek. The chieftain ended up raising an entire wave of magma formed out of the red line with his blade, one that threatened to swallow Zebek up. But the pirate captain seemed undeterred, he instead also covered his body in a cloak of blue fire, his eyes shining as he punched through the wave of magma and propelled himself forward into the chieftain. The chieftain's sword was already cutting into Zebek's torso when he passed through the wave of magma, but he was unable to kill off the pirate captain's momentum. Instead, Zebek's punch impaled the chieftain's chest and brought him to the ground, segmenting the lava and field all around them and sending any nearby hunter flying backwards. The chieftain's sword impaled Zebek through the chest as well, just as his vision started going blurry. In the end, Zebek's flames ended up eating at the chieftain's body, turning it into charcoal almost instantly as the chieftain could only look at Zebek with a fearful gaze. That was the last emotion that the chieftain had felt. Fear. Fear when gazing into the eyes of the injured beast he had been fighting. Fear at the monster he had helped create. After the chieftain's death, the fight didn't last much longer. Zebek was already far too tired and injured to get involved in it, but the hunters were extremely discouraged, allowing Francisco and the rest to take them out much more easily. In the end, the rocks pirates were injured quite severely during the conflict, Koreha was safe thanks to Shiki floating her up on some rocks when the hunters appeared. For all of his posturing and teasing, Shiki did care quite a bit about their older doctor. Maybe it was a bit of a childhood crush on a more mature woman. Who knew? But Shiki was the reason Koreha was able to survive against the Lunarian tribe. Shiki and the rest however were all littered with life-threatening injuries. Even Francisco had received a few arrows to his back and had narrowly avoided being impaled through the heart. In the end, Zebek still had enough strength to leave his Jolly Roger planted into the ground, using one of the spears that had been planted in his back as a pole. The Jolly Roger stood there as a sign of conquest, and the Rock's pirates left soon after that. Underscore underscore underscore. Enel sighed a bit when hearing the depressing way that things had ended for the Lunarian tribe. Entire lives were ruined on the whim of a revenge-driven madman. In the end. What did you ever learn about the full situation? Why did Zebek do what he did? Enel ended up asking as he crossed his arms. Both Francisco and Shiki seemed to have grim looks on their faces as they recalled that day, only Francisco seemed to have the answer though. He only explained the full story later on. But it is my understanding that he was too ambitious for his own good, as he put it. Francisco shrugged a bit as he continued explaining a few things. He wanted to go out and explore the world, and he did just that. However, he was hunted down and almost killed by the world government the second he stepped foot on the Sabaeity archipelago. Anil raised an eyebrow at that. How exactly did that tie into the village being at fault though? The chieftain of the village had apparently informed the world government of his whereabouts. 
I don't know how Zebek managed to learn of that, or how the tribe's location remained a secret to the government. But I know that Zebek was fortunate enough to have a celestial dragon take a liking to him, and turn him into a slave on the spot, which saved him from dying. Enel scowled a bit when hearing that, wondering why the government even bothered granting all of the wishes of the bottom feeders that called themselves world nobles. Alas, it seemed to have saved Zebek's life, though Enel was unsure if he could call that an overly good thing. Shiki just looked to the side and took another sip of his drink, seemingly not interested in the story, as he likely already knew it. He escaped a few years later when he was dragged off with his master to an auction. I was the slave on the stage at that time, shackled and bound. Zebek killed the celestial dragon and freed me along with the other slaves. I was decently strong even then, so he invited me to join his crew, and I did. Francisco smiled a bit as he remembered those times, the few times his former captain had acted decently. And the rest is history. Enel continued as he sighed. Huh, this story's always annoying. Out of everyone, you were recruited in the least antagonizing way. Makes me a bit jealous. Shiki scowled as he remembered how he and the rest had to be both beaten down and threatened into joining Zebek's crew. Ha! His recruitment methods were truly not conventional. Francisco just scratched the back of his head and showed the other two a forced smile. Not conventional? Shiki's scowl deepened. No need to defend him. He was actual scum and treated others worse than the dirt he stepped on. It was the main reason so many people banded against him. Shiki's words sounded personal. And who could blame him? His experience with Zebek wasn't all that nice, to say the least. Even then, he had believed that Zebek would be able to accomplish something great at one point. Only for everything to fall apart at God Valley. I can't argue with the truth. He really wasn't a good captain. But he was strong, ambitious. I wanted to trust in his vision as well. But we may have gone overboard in many places. Francisco just sighed as he finally downed his bottle of sake. It's all in the past now. Emil said as he slowly stood up, having heard what he wanted. I won't hold it against either of you. The lighting emperor smiled as he turned and looked at the window. So you're off now? Any destination? Francisco smiled a bit as he looked at his new captain's back. Vega punk. I have quite a few things to sort out there. Enel smiled as he turned his head and gave Francisco and Shiki one last look. That guy? Shiki scoffed before giving Enel one last glance. Watch out around him, he used to work with Buckingham Stussy, a former crewmate of ours. Real weirdo. The golden lion scoffed as he remembered that crewmate of theirs. She just had some weird obsession with Whitebeard. Nothing too strange. Francisco simply shrugged, and Enel raised an eyebrow at their conversation. Stussy. Wait a minute. Wasn't she the agent that directed me to Vegapunk? But she's too young to have been a rocks pirate. I guess I'll have to ask Vegapunk more about it. Hmm. Thanks for the heads up. I'll have to look into a few things with him. Enel waved at the two old pirates and disappeared in a flash of lightning. Instead of reappearing at his home, he reappeared in front of a different house. The sun had already set, so only the dim light of the stars was shining overhead. Maybe emboldened by alcohol mixed with a desire to see someone specifically. But he decided to take the next step as he raised his hand slightly to knock on the door. Enel's fingers gently knocked on the wooden door a few times. He stood there with a small smile on his face, a tired yawn could be heard from the other side before the door opened. The disheveled figure of Robin answered the door, with messy bed hair and tired eyes. The lightning emperor was a bit amused to see her like that, he smiled and leaned on the doorframe. Well, weren't you sleeping in rather early? He asked in a cheeky tone as one of his earlobes quickly shot up and prevented Robin from slamming the door in his face. And Robin did try, looking a bit frustrated at the emperor that rolled up to her door at midnight. After trying a few times and failing, she ended up rubbing the bridge of her nose and opening her mouth. What? 
It's really late and I'm tired from training. Robin sounded truly exhausted, which made Enel feel a bit worse about interrupting her sleep. Well. I just felt like dropping by, seeing you and all that. Enel scratched the back of his head with an awkward gaze, it was only then that Robin noticed something and her eyes widened. W8. You have both hands now? She seemed to instantly gain a burst of energy as she got closer to Enel and studied his body for a few seconds, blinking a few times as she tapped his newly regrown arm with a curious gaze. This. Did Bonnie help you after all? She asked as she finally looked up to the much taller Enel, her eyes shining a bit underneath the dim light of the stars. Yep. Sengoku is also on the island now. How have you been? Enel smiled a bit as he answered her question in kind. Robin looked into the emperor's eyes for a few seconds, before simply sighing. Well. Since you're here you might as well come in. We can talk more inside, maybe over a cup of tea. Enel just smiled and walked in. The two of them ended up speaking for a good portion of the night, with Enel falling asleep at some point, and Robin covering him with a bedsheet before going back to bed herself. Underscore underscore underscore. Hope you liked the chapter. Kinda liked writing about the rocks, might, will certainly, make another story time like this later on, winky face. Sorry for not posting yesterday, had a bit of work and ended up being unable to write anything at all. At least I got around to it today, smiley face. If you wanna support me look up Vegan Master, Vegan Cult, on Patter underscore on, you'd also get 10 chapters in advance, or 5 depending on tier. Chapter 173, Egghead Island, Conversation and Soul. Underscore 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 POV anal underscore underscore underscore. It's been a while since I've woken up like this. Well, sleeping on a chair isn't unusual for me, sleeping on a bed for once would have been quite shocking but I am not at my house. Robin seems to still be asleep, it's my fault for keeping her up all night really. Well, I don't regret it, getting to spend more time with her that is. I can barely wait to train her personally once more. I guess I just find her interesting. Despite her tragic past, she is able to put it all behind her and push forward with a determination few people would have. I will make sure that she is strong enough when she eventually rejoins the Straw Hats. I will make her strong enough to offset any developmental issues that might occur due to the missing Doflamingo. Luffy should also be training with Rayleigh and Ace currently. At least that's what Whitebird seemed to think. It's unlikely that the two brothers would be separated during these two years. Ace is also likely too ashamed to show his face to Whitebird and the rest. Plenty of people died to save him after all. Well, he'll get over it. Even then it's not any of my business. I am not exactly a friend of Ace, nor do I really know him. For now, I need to focus on finally helping Kuma for good. Bonnie is already part of our crew, but I don't like to half-ass things, I must use my whole ass. Ha! <laughs> I've always been against vulgar jokes like that. But I guess my perspective on politeness and language, in general, has changed the past few months. Well. I better get going. I don't feel like waking up Robin for this. It might also turn out to be a rather short journey depending on how Vegapunk can actually help me. There's also the matter with Stussy. And Buckingham Stussy. The government agent and former Rocks pirate. Whether or not they're the same person, Vegapunk of all people should be able to give me a few answers. Underscore 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 POV narration underscore underscore underscore. Enel rose from his seat, slowly and silently, he looked at Robin one last time before smiling and folding up the blanket that had been shared with him and placing it on the table. He then silently picked up his staff and walked out of the door, disappearing in a flash of lighting as soon as he stepped out the door. His destination was clear, he first went and took a shower, and grabbed a new pair of deep blue suit pants, 
a black t-shirt and his white furred coat. He tapped the tips of his black shoes on the ground one at a time, before turning and looking at the log pose that Stussy had given him. With a sigh, he swept his blonde hair backwards and turned his staff into a pair of gauntlets. Time for a friendly visit. Ha! Huh? Hope the world government doesn't have that many agents there. Enel then vanished once more, this time following the directions of the log pose. He flashed through the skies at inconceivable speeds, stopping occasionally and glancing over at the special compass. It took only a few minutes for him to find the island. It wasn't exactly hard to spot. And just by looking at it, Enel could tell that the island was far ahead of the rest of the world when it came to technology. It was actually insane to even look at, everything about it felt otherworld. Even to the man that had built flying ships, gigantic island transporting methods and technically helped turn someone into a cyborg, or half-cyborg. In the first place, the world of One Piece had always given off the feeling that it was a bit behind the earth that Enel slash Alexander had originally hailed from. It did surpass Earth in many ways, just from the things that Frankie had been shown to build, as well as the pacifistas. But Egghead Island was on a completely different level. The island seemed to be made out of different zones, the first zone seemed to be flourishing, filled with researchers and experiments. It also appeared to be some sort of industrial zone. There were robots all over that island, Enel was able to see animals flying through the skies, each one of them being robots on the same level of complexity as pacifistas. Then there was the giant island that sat on what looked like an island cloud. Something that Enel was quite familiar with. That island seemed to be even more impressive than the industrial zone. Though its design was a bit odd, looking like a cracked egg, hovering in midair permanently. Enel was able to read the words, punk records on the inside of the upper eggshell. The emperor was unable to surmise what materials went into making said eggshell, but they appeared to be quite sturdy. The most surprising part was the utter lack of government agents on the island. I guess they no longer have that many agents to spare. Although, it did feel a bit strange for the world government to leave such an important place undefended. Now then. Where would I be if I were Vegapunk? Unfortunately, Enel was about to find out that Vegapunk's island was far from undefended. Gigantic tentacles rose out of the water and pointed their tips at the Flying Emperor, which caused Enel to quickly take notice of them. He had felt them previously thanks to his radar but didn't pay them much mind. Now he could see the tentacles unfold like metallic flowers, revealing what Enel assumed were gun barrels. In that instant, with the help of a bit of premonition, Enel turned into a flash of light and danced around a few lasers that threatened to burn holes all over his body. Enel felt that they were similar to those of the pacifistas, so they weren't quite as dangerous to him, but he dodged them nonetheless. A rather heated greeting. More and more beings rose out of the waters, struggling to reach the emperor, who could now sense panic descending on the island. He felt the researchers entering shelters while the metallic sea creatures below all started shooting lasers and flying discs at him. He continued doing around, sometimes intercepting the lasers with his own lightning bolts. He wanted to avoid destroying the robots if possible, after all, he was no enemy of Vegapunk, at least he didn't want to be an enemy. Dragon had already informed Enel that the mad scientist was in contact with the revolutionaries. An ally, so to speak but that only made the fact that the robots were attacking him even more confusing. It should already be well known that I am in cahoots with the revolutionaries. So why would Vegapunk target me? Is it to keep up appearances for the world government? If yes, then how exactly do I even approach this island? Enel was well and truly stumped. At least until he finally felt a figure waving at him from the island. It was a masked man, dressed in rather futuristic clothing. When seeing that, Enel decided to focus on him for a few seconds, only to receive a message said as more of a hushed whisper. I am Vega Punk. Run away, then come back near the punk records by descending from the clouds. Enel simply nodded, before disappearing in a flash of light. He then waited around an hour or half an hour for the situation to calm down completely. It seemed odd that Vegapunk knew of his ability to hear over such distances. I don't think I even informed Dragon of this application of my fruit. 
Enel sat on a cloud for a while, before doing as instructed and descending towards the punk records as quickly as he could. There were no closed doors in the facility, seemingly awaiting his arrival. Electricity in the entire laboratory seemed to have gone out, including generators, which meant no cameras and no prying eyes. And inside the gigantic laboratory, Enel was able to feel two men awaiting him in a side office. He strolled in confidently, looking around with a curious gaze. There were far too many interesting things to be found on Vegapunk's island, it was truly impossible for Enel to focus on everything at once. One of the men Enel recognized. The masked man that had advised him to flee and return. From closer, he could tell apart a few more details though. The man wasn't exactly wearing a mask, it was in actuality, a futuristic metal helmet bearing the number 01 over the face. He wore a very long dark coat with light-colored patterns, the jacket has the words Vegapunk 01 written at the bottom and caution written on the left sleeve. He also wore a pair of very large boots that ran all the way up to where his jacket ended, leaving little to no skin exposed. The other person inside the room however was different. Enel was looking at a relatively tall elderly man, a bit taller than Enel, who was currently 2.7 meters. Despite his gigantic build, his limbs were relatively slender. He also had a remarkably long tongue which seemed to hang out. He seemed to be mostly bald on top, but with spiky white hair on the sides, as well as a thick mustache. He wore rather casual clothing, a polka dot shirt, dark pants, and shoes. However, he had a noticeably elongated but neatly sliced head and has a shaft driven in to support a structure resembling the top of an apple core and its leaf. Enel blinked a few times as he realized that the man in front of him simply didn't have a brain. How? Well, this island is a lot more advanced than I thought. I guess everything is possible. The man's large eyes seemed to be studying Enel without even a hint of fear. It was only then that Enel started seeing some resemblance between the man in front of him and Einstein, who really needed no introduction. Though the resemblance was faint. Sky King Enel. One of the five emperors. The one that tipped the scales and ruined the balance of the world in a short few months. The masked man was the first one to speak. Dr. Vega Punk. A pleasure to finally meet you. I've been hearing a lot about you. Enel narrowed his eyes and smiled at the masked man, before turning to the other man with an odd gaze. And you must be? The man then smiled widely. I am Vega Punk. The old man continued smiling even as Enel looked at the two of them with confusion. We are both Vegapunk, I am one of the six satellites. We all share one brain. You may call me Shaka. The masked man bowed slightly, showcasing polite mannerisms one would hardly expect out of a mad scientist. Six satellites? So Vegapunk is actually six people? And you must be. Enel then turned his head to the Vegapunk with the missing brain. I am the main body, the six satellites call me Stella, but you can just call me Vegapunk. The old man nodded and slowly gestured for Enel to take a seat. The emperor nodded and finally sat down. So there are actually seven people sharing one brain. The main body included. So, how may we assist you? We, unfortunately, don't have a lot of time as the government will definitely notice the outage soon. Shaka spoke out as he crossed his arms and looked at Enel through his helmet. I'll cut things short then. I'm here on two different matters. First off, and most importantly, do you know any way to assist Bartholomew Kuma? Enel decided to start off with that matter, as it was truly the most pressing issue. Vegapunk's eyes immediately widened, they seemed to be filled with both regret and shame. Kuma. He was resolute till the end. I failed him greatly as well. Vegapunk shook his head as he spoke, Shaka also sighing a bit. Enel just raised an eyebrow at that, unsure of the man's story with Kuma. I had promised him that I'd allow him to protect Straw Hat's ship for two years as a pacifista. But I was unable to uphold that promise. The scientist sighed in regret as he spoke, and Enel blinked a few times, having forgotten what had happened to the Thousand Sunny while the crew was away training. 
Alas, the world government can no longer be reasoned with. He was immediately turned into a slave to protect the Holy Land. Though knowing the celestial dragons he was most likely just a toy to them. Vegapunk shook his head and Enel looked a bit to the side. Yet another thing I've influenced with my presence. It can't really be helped at this point. I'll just leave this one up to fate, I doubt Rayleigh would let anything happen to that ship anyway. Unfortunately we are unable to reverse what has been done. He is the first human weapon, maybe with enough time I could attempt it, but I don't think I'd be able to do so under the world government's watch. Shaka spoke out this time, sharing his perspective as well, while also deciding to be the one to give Enel the bad news. Well, we do have a way to undo what has been done to him. In fact, we already have. He is no longer a pacifista. Enel crossed his gauntlet arms as he looked at both versions of Vegapunk. Both Shaka and Vegapunk seemed to be staring at Enel with wide eyes at that time. After all, how could such a thing be possible? It would warrant a genius just as great as Vegapunk's in a laboratory just as well equipped, which was impossible to find in the world. We used the powers of the Time Time Fruit. Jewelry Bonnie, Kuma's aunt, was able to reverse his body to a state before any cybernetic modifications were done to it. Enel nodded and decided to just tell them the truth, as there was no reason to lie to an ally. And Vegapunk's eyes seemed to become saucers, as the possibilities of that fruit seemed to be racing through his mind. Interesting. I did hear of that fruit before, but I thought the person using it had long since gone into hiding after escaping the world government in the past. And to think they're related to Kuma. Vegapunk seemed to truly be overwhelmed for once, but it didn't last long, as the old man shook his head. His mind seemed to immediately want to know more. So, if he's reversed to a previous position in time, how exactly can I help? Well, his body has reversed. At first, he was in a sort of coma, but after waking up he was completely unresponsive. It's as if the lights are on, but there's nobody at home. Enel was quick to give a description of the situation, as detailed as he could. Vegapunk nodded along, his long tongue bobbing up and down as he stroked his chin a bit. It only took a few seconds in real time for the greatest mind in the world to reach a conclusion. Memories the main body of the doctor said as Shaka also nodded. Before completing the transformation, I convinced Kuma to try something out. I wanted something to be left behind from him, even if he was to become a husk. Before the final operation, he finally managed to do it. He used his devil fruit to expel his memories and life's experiences out of his body. His devil fruit can do that? Enel asked as he blinked a few times and tried to remember how the pawpaw fruit appeared to work in the series. It wasn't long before he remembered a rather iconic scene. When Kuma took out all of the pain and stress from Luffy's unconscious body. He remembered Zoro being able to absorb it, having to go through a lot of pain in order to spare his captain's life. It's likely similar to that. But to think the pawpaw fruit can even extract memories. Wait. Memories are stored in the soul as well, right? Ha! I guess this does explain why Bonnie wasn't able to heal him completely. Kuma hadn't just expelled his memories, he had inadvertently pushed out a part of his soul, the part that was most important which contained all of his memories. Since Bonnie's devil fruit wasn't able to affect souls, she was only able to heal his body, but his soul remained fragmented in a sense. Things become quite straightforward from here then. I'm assuming you are keeping the memories bubble safe in this laboratory, right? Anil asked as he slowly stood up. Yes. But transporting it would require a rather large container, I can provide that, but do you have any way to transport such a thing? And with extreme care, by the way. Vegapunk was ecstatic to hear that Kuma could have a chance at life again. He had worried that he killed him before, but now hope reignited in the old doctor. I can turn my gauntlets in a large flying ship, large enough to transport hundreds of people, so it should be large enough to envelop and transport any cargo with care." Enel nodded as he crossed his arms. In that case we'll quickly make preparations for the memories to be transported safely. We, unfortunately, don't have much time left, so we need to get everything done in a hurry. 
Shaka quickly got to work, walking off and leaving the main body with Enel, who sighed as he now had some assurance that Kuma would get healed properly. Now, I hope they have enough time to talk about the other thing. Underscore underscore underscore. Hope you liked the chapter. This one was around 3k words. Kinda long, but I didn't want to split up the egghead interaction into two chapters. If you want to support me look up Vegan Master, Vegan Cult, on Patter underscore on, you'd also get 10 chapters in advance, or 5 depending on tier. Chapter 174, Buckingham, Swift Departure, and Third Side. Underscore 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 POV narration underscore underscore underscore. While Shaka is handling that, I do have a few questions for you. Enel said as he clapped his hands with a smile on his face. Well, I guess we do still have a few minutes, Vegapunk said as he rubbed his mustache for a few seconds. It's in relation to the person called Stussy. I believe she was the queen of the Pleasure District a while back. Whom? A government agent. What of her? Vegapunk seemed to raise an eyebrow, looking a bit confused. She was the one to direct me to you. I also couldn't help but hear about yet another Stussy that used to work with you, a former member of the Rock's crew. Enel quickly got to the point, wanting to at least get some answers before having to fly away. So she sent you here? I guess she didn't get around to telling me. Not that contact between us is all that convenient. Vegapunk slowly shook his head before looking Enel in the eye. Enel just raised an eyebrow when hearing that. So is this Stussy also an ally? Stussy, the government agent currently supervising Warlord Buggy is an ally of mine. Vegapunk nodded as if he had heard Enel's thoughts. To be more exact, the Stussy you spoke to is the clone of Buckingham Stussy, the member of the former Rocks Pirates. So she's a clone you created? Vegapunk's answers only seem to raise more questions for the Lightning Emperor. Well, I wasn't alone, she was created by the MADS, and is the first successful clone ever created. The main body of Vegapunk didn't seem to want to hold out on any details. He explained in rather quick terms that Stussy masquerading as a government agent was the masterpiece of the MADS, and that it had helped them perfect their research into cloning. Buckingham Stussy herself was interested in cloning technology for her own reasons though, unfortunately, Vegapunk didn't know what her reasons were. But he was able to confirm that Stussy was indeed obsessed with Whitebeard, even raising an eyebrow when hearing Enel mention that. Obsessed would be putting it lightly. She was beyond insane when it came to that man, and he barely paid her any attention. Vegapunk chuckled a bit when remembering that. That's a bit odd. Whitebeard was always searching for a family, wouldn't he be interested in starting his own? Enel also smiled a bit as he spoke out remembering the dream of Edward Newgate, a dream that had nothing to do at all with piracy. It was the simple dream of a man with a rocky start and a big heart. And he had already achieved it, creating a large family, possibly the largest in the world, yet filled with love and care. Whom? I don't know much about Whitebeard personally. But I do know that he never considered any of the former Rocks members people he wanted near his crew, which he views as his family. I'm sure there were exceptions, but Stussy was not one of them. Vegapunk rubbed his chin as he tried to search his memory for any other details he may have missed out. Alas, there wasn't much else he could add, as he hadn't seen Stussy in decades. That's about all I can tell you really. Regarding Whitebeard and Stussy, you may want to ask them about it personally. And in regards to cloning, I know that Vinsmoke has used cloning technology further in creating an army. I don't know much about the whereabouts of the other members of the MADS. Vegapunk ended up sighing as he finished talking about that subject. That's fine. Still find it difficult to understand how you managed to make Stussy's clone into an agent. Wouldn't she be well known if she was part of the Rocks Pirates? Enel still seemed to have quite a few questions for the old man. You'd be surprised just how many former members of the Rocks are still going around in the world. It was a rather large crew if you count the number of pirates that Zebek had subjugated, it was a grand fleet, unmatched at the time. Vegapunk simply shook his head. It was impossible for the government to keep track of all of the members of the Rocks Pirates, 
they only remembered the ones that had fought alongside Zebek, or the strongest members of the crew. People that didn't participate in fighting often were simply forgotten after their records were erased from history. The government didn't even put that much of an emphasis on them, as they failed to perceive them as threats. The more Enel thought about it, the more it made sense. It was yet another example of their negligence. Just like how they had failed to kill Francisco and had forgotten him in the depths of Impel Down. Or how they had failed to kill many of the people trapped in the lowest levels of Impel Down. I guess Correja and Stussy being able to live normally shouldn't be all that surprising when you put it like that. I understand, so you're saying some people slipped through the cracks. I appreciate the information, I'll also have to look into it at some point. Enel then slowly stood up, as he felt Shaka already finishing up packaging the container that held Kuma's memories. Vegapunk's main body just nodded before Enel turned around and started leaving towards the container. Before he left, he stopped and looked back, tilting his head slightly as he did so. One last question. The Emperor's voice sounded calm, but also curious. Have you also been researching cloning? I can sense a few interesting things on this island. Vegapunk narrowed his eyes and looked at the Emperor with a calm smile on his lips. Of course. My main project right now is related to cloning. I'm sure you will find it intriguing as well. The scientist chuckled a bit as he didn't bother to hold any details back. Enel didn't know much about what Vegapunk was researching, he thought the mad scientist would still be perfecting the pacifistas at that stage, but it seemed like he had other plans. He sensed many different things on Eggshell Island, he could feel many containers with many embryos in them. If I were to wager a guess, he's cloning powerful people. I guess I'll just have to wait and see what exactly he has in mind. Knowing he is not loyal to the world government already gives me enough assurance. Got it. I'll be looking forward to it. Enel nodded before turning into a flash of lightning and disappearing from the room. Enel's next interaction with Shaka was not that long either, it was just the satellite informing him of how to transport the container safely, and giving him some information on how Kuma's fruit worked. Shaka did make sure to give Enel a piece of advice, or a warning. Keep in mind. Kuma right now is a shell of his former self. You will force his memories back into him, and with that, you will also force all of his pain and hardship back into him. It will be like torture, for him to relieve all of the hardship and pain he had gone through all in one moment. Anil scowled a bit when hearing that. So it's not going to be that simple, huh? But? Shaka continued, turning and looking up at Anil's face. Kuma is strong, if there's anyone out there strong enough to overcome this then it is him. I hope to hear only good things from you." Enel ended up just nodding and leaving quickly, turning his ship into a large warship, and carrying the container within layers of aluminum and the other materials that had been molded into his staff. His ship flew quickly leaving the range of Eggshell Island just as the lights and mechanisms on the island seemed to start working once more. The world government will definitely have their suspicions about this meeting. Especially since I approached the island carelessly at first. But there's not much they can do, Vegapunk is far too valuable for them to discard anyway. The emperor ended up just shaking his head and looking at the horizon. Another journey huh? At least I got to sleep a bit before starting it. And just like that, Anil had started his journey back to the Sky Islands, flying far above the clouds. While he flew. Not that far from him someone else was having a bit of trouble. Kaido, the large dragon emperor had just arrived back to Ueno, sporting a new set of scars that seemed to scare his subordinates. He was mad both at himself and at how things had developed. Kaido at some points thought that only the likes of Joy Boy would be able to kill him. But now the world had shifted. Things had changed. But there was no time for contemplation and complaints. Kaido was now faced with a rather existential crisis. A war is nigh. It doesn't seem to be an equal war. I just can't wrap my mind around the world government contending with the army that Enel has gathered already. It honestly makes the rocks pirates of old look like an insignificant threat. Kaido knew that he only had so many choices left. 
he could either choose to join a side of the war. The only viable side for him to choose would be Enel's. But he didn't want that. Thankfully there was the option of creating his own side, a third party that could join the war later and reap the benefits. And he knew just the people to ask. Well, he had plenty of options to choose from, but he decided to take a rather interesting approach. King. Queen. The emperor called out to his two most trusted men. The only two living members of the three stars. The two men bowed slightly as they entered the room, showing their respect for the presence of the emperor that had reduced them from the Sky Islands. I want the two of you to contact several people. Including red-haired Shanks, Whitebeard and Big Mom. It is time we unified the new world. The two men bowed once more. Of course, Lord Kaido. We will see to it right away. It's about time someone else shakes up the scenery. If the other emperors come together, then we will be able to subjugate all of the other pirates in the new world quickly. Kaido quickly planned out his journey, but he wasn't stupid. He knew that there was a high chance the other emperors already had their own plans. He also knew that Whitebird was likely already working with Enel. And he also had his suspicions about Big Mom. But he had to take his chances. Worst case scenario. I will have to personally sail the seas and unite the pirates of the new world under my mantle. If I can't get the other emperors to join me then I'll at least make sure they won't oppose me. The dragon emperor cackled madly as he picked up a barrel of sake and started ordering his men to look into different pirate crews and organizations. The sooner I start the better. I won't be the one left in the dust in this race. Even if I die. I'd much rather die gloriously in the war, fighting for myself and no one else. Underscore underscore underscore. Hope you liked the chapter. Sorry about yesterday again. Honestly, I thought that having more free time would allow me to write more, but I guess creativity and inspiration replenish slowly, smiley face. If you want to support me look up Vegan Master, Vegan Cult, on Patter underscore on, you'd also get 10 chapters in advance, or 5 depending on tier. Chapter 175, Perspective of a Blind Man in General Meeting. Underscore 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 POV Fujitora underscore underscore underscore. It's hard to explain just how eventful the past few months have been. Went from randomly wandering the world after taking away my sight, to being recruited in the Navy. I thought that maybe joining the side of justice would allow me to repent for my sins. Becoming an admiral right away was a bit unusual, but it's not like there was no precedent for it. The world itself being in a dire state certainly helped. The government's actions were quite weird, however. Even at the time, I had hoped to join them in order to stop their egregious actions against protests from the inside, but that didn't really go anywhere. I guess it was a bit foolish of me to expect the government that massacred so many to listen to my words, no matter the position of power that I occupied. Alas, one can't exactly expect foresight from a blind man, right? The main issue was that we had no influence. But that could be fixed. The marines just needed to prove themselves once more, and get the situation back to the norm. We could do it. Akainu also seemed confident that we could turn things around. We just needed to win a few battles. I was not expecting my very first mission to be my last. It was my first time fighting an emperor, and I must say. It was a lot different from what I expected. Enel is a fighter that mainly relies on his devil fruit from what I was able to sense, much like myself. His observation hockey also advanced to the point where he managed to fight all of us while gaining very few injuries. However, throughout the fight, I couldn't help but get the feeling that he was not being serious. Purposefully avoiding seriously injuring the marines. That was my first hint that his relationship with the marines was a bit more complex than outright hatred although Sengoku still seemed a bit mad at Enel. The Sky King's devil fruit's powers are, at the end of the day, extremely lethal. Any one of his attacks could kill, and his speed could also only be matched by Kazaro, who was almost taken out of the fight right at the beginning. Regardless, what happened happened. We somehow managed to trap him at the time. 
only for the government to destroy Baltigo. So I went from vagrant to Marine Admiral to Revolutionary Army member in the span of a week. And from the Revolutionary Army, to find out I am technically working for, or with, the Sky King that I was fighting before. We haven't exchanged all that many words, but even without eyes, I can see that we are all gathered in this place because of him. He is the glue holding everything together, sky people, pirates, revolutionaries, marines, even old legends that I didn't think I'd ever get to be in proximity of. An alliance so bizarre that it was likely far beyond the expectations of the government. Enel does seem to have some talent, gathering this many powerful people in one place. Be it sheer luck, charisma, or cunning, he has achieved more than any other. But would this be enough to actually stop the world government's tyranny? I sure hope so. It's times like this that I wish I hadn't taken away my own sight. To see this gigantic army grow with my own two eyes? And to watch the leader they all gathered under. But my sight was taken for a reason. My sins were great. But maybe it's here that I can actually repent. It's on this side that I can actually make a change. Whatever happens in this upcoming war, I'll make sure that the one holding all of us together survives. Since it's because of him that I am given a chance at redemption. Then I will gladly lay down my life for him. I just hope it will be enough. For now, only time can tell. Underscore 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 POV narration underscore underscore underscore. The destroyed Holy Land was swiftly reconstructed. The dwindled forces of the world government getting to work, now low on slave labor, but still having some agents to throw at the project. The site was to be rebuilt, but the celestial dragons needed to remain in hiding, as the elders knew they couldn't afford to allow them to run wild and die. They were at the point where simply going on the streets would be dangerous, especially since the protests hadn't been exactly quelled. The more the elders fought it through, the more they realized just how much of the world they'd have to reform. History itself would have to be rewritten. But it wasn't like they hadn't done it before, they already had experience. Even now, they stood in the middle of a room, all five of the elders, alongside a few other characters. One of them was a bandaged up Kong, both of his arms were in slings, and he had certainly seen better days. The bitter look in his eyes hadn't subsided ever since he had woken up. Alas, no one could really blame him. Facing both Francisco and Shiki was not something anyone would normally be able to do. Aramaki was certainly nowhere near as capable. But he had survived as well, and he was present. His torso was completely covered up in bandages, and his entire body was healing much faster than that of normal humans, but even then he had almost died. The wooden fleet admiral knew that he only had himself to blame. He had greatly underestimated Shiki, and had lost miserably. He was now also present in the meeting, with the elders discussing their failure openly. Not only were the slaves freed, but we've also lost plenty of men in that mess. Saint Ogata, the blind swordsman, spoke out as he recounted the events of that day. Kuma being freed is a bit concerning as well. Saint Noda, the most influential elder, was quick to point that out as well. He was the prototype for the pacifistas, it's regrettable, but I doubt they'll be able to do much with him. Saint Ogata shrugged as he tapped his fingers on the tip of his hilt. I'd say the most concerning thing here is the force that is obviously rearing its head over the horizon. Kong spoke out as he looked down thoughtfully, narrowing his eyes as the elders turned to look at him. Francisco, Shiki, the revolutionaries. Who knows how many others are working together currently. And it all seems to tie together to one person. Kong scowled as he spoke, turning his head to the side before looking back at the elders. Emperor Enel. Saint Hirano, the shortest one, said as he audibly hissed for a second. His words were containing enough hate to kill a man. He's been a thorn in our side ever since he reared his ugly head. Saint Ogata also seemed just as angry. A variable that not even Lord I.M. was able to foresee. Saint Noda muttered as he closed his eyes and nodded in a sagely manner. Calling him a mere variable at this point is no longer enough. Kong scowled as he spoke out, making the elders nod in agreement. 
Kong was one of the few people that could openly talk to them, being the one exactly under them. You are completely right. He is clearly more than that. A man who single-handedly did more against us than anybody else ever since the void century. A true enemy. The only other possible contender for that title in recent history was Rox D. Uzebek. Everything somehow seems to begin and end with him. He somehow even emboldened Morgans to release the dirt he had on us. Saint Noda nodded as he opened his eyes and looked at Kong with a calm gaze. Kong looked to the side and sighed. His power is even more concerning than what Zebek had gathered. Even the slaves they freed can form a fighting force since plenty of them were battle slaves. Inconsequential at best. I can end them all in one slice. Saint Ogata just scoffed at the notion as he slightly adjusted his round glasses. The other elders seemed to agree with him. They weren't exactly concerned about a few runaway slaves. The authority of the government couldn't be undermined more than it already was, so they hadn't lost much in that department either. Maybe. But it's still concerning. Why weren't we allowed to use any of the ancient weapons? Kong still seemed dissatisfied. Well. The Pluton cannons were all moved to act as extra insurance and protect the world nobles. Francisco of all people should know what they are and how to avoid them so they wouldn't have made much of a difference. Saint Nota simply shook his head as he spoke out, calmly explaining their reasoning. And the recording of Poseidon is not something we can use casually. Not that it would have been too useful against the two men that attacked us. Near sea monsters wouldn't have been able to do more than paint the seas around the Holy Land red in their own blood. By the time something more responded, everything would have been over anyway. His younger brother, Saint Sanob, was the one to continue. Talking a bit more about the other weapon in their hands. Kong just sighed, as he couldn't exactly argue with the elders. Though he still felt there was more they could have done. All will be well in the end. Our Lord is already slowly regaining his vision. The future is becoming clearer and clearer. Soon he may give us a prediction once more. One to include this variable turned enemy, that spawned on the world seemingly out of nowhere. Saint Notus simply closed his eyes once more. The trust and confidence of the elders seemed to be unshakable, it seemed to somewhat inspire Aramaki, who had been merely listening patiently up to that point. Kong wasn't quite as hopeful. Some prediction. If it's as good as the last one, then we're well and truly doomed. A war was predicted to come regardless of that outsider's interference. So we already are prepared for it. Saint Ogata said as his bald head shined in the light. Vegapunk's research is crucial to our preparation. Yet it is still debatable whether or not he can truly be trusted. Saint Masatani, the youngest among them, said as he rubbed his short blonde beard thoughtfully. We shall prepare for all eventualities. The most recent reports say that the Sky King tried to pay a visit to the Mad Doctor. Saint Ogata said as he scowled a bit. They are currently in a blackout. It's either the result of that attack, which was routed from my understanding, or it's Vegapunk trying something behind our backs. Saint Nota's calm expression seemed to also morph into a scowl when speaking about that. Vegapunk was someone they were keeping up to date with constantly. He was an extremely important person to the world government at the end of the day. We still have plenty of leverage over him. For now, he'll do as told, build the seraphims. We must get rid of him as soon as possible after they are built. Saint Noda continued speaking, the other people in the room seemingly nodding in agreement, even Aramaki. The fleet admiral was already brought up to speed on Vegapunk's situation and he knew that it was a rather fickle agreement between him and the world government. For now, this is a waiting game. Unless Enel decides to speed things up a bit, which is unlikely in my opinion. Saint Ogata said as he slowly took off his glasses and started cleaning them with a cloth. He's already shown he's more than willing to openly attack us. Saint Mazutane spoke out, reminding everyone of the possibility that the emperor would attack them any day. Yet. He didn't come to the Holy Land himself. 
Saint Noda spoke out as he smirked slightly. He didn't bring his army, he didn't actually attack us at all. He was seemingly after the slaves. We can tell he's a cautious person already since none of our attempts to bait him has worked in the past. Our lord's display on Baltigo is likely enough to make him hesitate to attack us anytime soon. Saint Noda was quick to dissect the situation and come to the conclusion that the attack wasn't going to happen soon. But there were still plenty of doubts in the room. In the end, Noda just sighed and shook his head. Let's just wait till our lord reaches out to us with a revised premonition. All should become clear at that time. In the end, that was the conclusion the elders managed to reach in that conversation. Kong remained the only person still skeptical in the room. Maybe I should have left with Z and Suru. Or at least tried harder to convince them to stay. The old man just shook his head at that thought. It was already too late anyway. He had picked his side. Underscore underscore underscore.